And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. And today we're going to look at something that is very, very tragic. In fact, this subject, it saddens me. You know, I used to read about things like this, and when I discovered the facts, I I got angry. I got really angry. But now, as I get older, I, I think I'm saddened. You know, I want to title this program today, The Phoenix Program. The Phoenix Program. Now, what what is the Phoenix Program? Well, it's torture. It's murder. It's done by the United States of America. Now, if you, you don't believe that America tortures and kills and does so on a massive, colossal scale, then you might just want to reach up and, you know, turn off the radios. I want to... Turn off your internet. Don't listen to this tape player, whatever the CD. Don't don't listen to it because you've been told. I mean, you've been told by Bill O'Reilly on O'Reilly Factor, Fox News. We don't torture. And George Bush and Dick Cheney and everybody says Americans don't torture. We don't stoop that low. They're liars. Somehow they've been able to convince Americans that they're that they're telling the truth. I want to talk to you today about the Phoenix program. You see, I have some small familiarity with the Phoenix program. It happened back in Vietnam, but it didn't end there and it didn't start there. But perhaps it, maybe we can see it in its horrible nature by looking at the Phoenix program. Now, first of all, I want you to ask yourself, what is the Phoenix program? You see, in Vietnam, in the 60s and 70s, the United States really got its concentration camp program in high gear. Well, let me stop right there. What is that? The United States had a concentration camp program? And they put it in high gear? Well, that can't be. We went into Vietnam, and, of course, the the Viet Cong were the, the monsters. They they tortured people and they cut off heads and did terrible things to civilians. And we went there to pacify the nation. Uh-oh. Pacify. What does that word mean? You know, for many years, I was a young man on in all this program. In 1962, I joined the Air Force. And the war was just cranking up big time. Of course, President Kennedy was killed a year later. I was in the blue Air Force, uh, Air Force uniform then. In 63, he was killed, and the war just exploded. We should have been getting out, but we really got in, and before long, we had over a half million troops in Vietnam. Most Americans couldn't even locate Vietnam on the map, just like many cannot, cannot even locate Iraq and Syria and Libya on the map today. But there we were. You know, in... 64, hearing about the war in Vietnam and what the Vietnamese were doing there and how we wonderful, great Americans were going to go over there and help free that country and give them democracy and beat the Viet Cong. That's great. I actually volunteered for, for Vietnam. I volunteered. Well, the Air Force accepted me as a volunteer, but they sent me to the neighboring nation of Thailand. But I went to Vietnam a little while and got the Vietnam Service Medal and then I went to uh, uh, neighboring uh, Cambodia uh, on aircraft. and But we were doing most of the bombing of uh, North Vietnam uh, uh, in Cambodia from Thailand. So really, I was in a way was there. Now, let me tell you how I first came to know the Phoenix program. Now, on the weekends, you know, we it, it was a place where you don't bring your wife. We couldn't bring our wife. It was sort of out in the country in Oh, I would call it sort of a scrub-type desert where I was stationed. We lived in huts. They were like, you know, like 
jungle huts, thatched roofs and all that. In fact, we had to go out of our our uh, little dormitory thatched roof and uh, to an outdoor toilet, and it was just like you know you had a country privy almost. We pulled a little rope, and enough water came down from the the container up there, and that's that's what we used to take a shower. Pretty rough. We had to watch uh, where we were walking because there were snakes. Didn't have any sidewalks and had quite a few snakes and didn't want to get bitten. But on Saturday nights, we would go down and, you know, and drink and all those things. And I wasn't really living for Jesus at the time. and But, you know, we would just have a, a good time, me and the guys. One night, myself and a friend went down town and we went and had a something to drink at a, a place and about, uh, on the next table were about four or five guys and they were there sort of cutting up and having a good time too they were americans and you know they looked at us we looked at them and they said hey we guys come on over to our table come over here and, you know party with us so we went over to their table and they turned out to be pretty good guys and kind of guys you want to drink with want to have a beer or a coke with Turned out that they were not in the Air Force at all. Uh, we didn't even know who they were. They they said, "Well, we're we're in the uh, special forces. We we fly uh, aircraft. We're not uh, pilots, but we fly on them, and we do our operations in Cambodia and North Vietnam and South Vietnam and special operations." Oh, okay. I knew a little bit about the Green Beret and the special forces and so forth, and so. They're my kind of people, you know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a young Air Force guy. I mean, you know, I'm the kind of guy they could have put me in the Air Commandos or something. So these guys, you know, were pretty, pretty good guys, I thought. And they probably were. But anyway, after we finished there, they said, "Hey, why don't you come on back to our? We got an apartment downtown. You know, of course, me and the airmen, the other airmen, we lived on the airbase. Well, we got us an, our own apartment downtown. Oh, you do? Yeah. So we went to their apartment." And we all sat around just drinking and talking and, you know, just shooting the bull. And they started talking about their operations. And they started bragging about what they had done. Now, you know, I sit there and I drank and I, we talked. And, and I, I think they wanted to impress us as airmen. They wanted to impress us with what they were doing. So one of them said, uh, we take prisoners. And then they laughed real big. One of them said, we don't take them for long, though. And the other said, no, nah, we don't. We get rid of those, you know, you know what's. I didn't really know what they're talking about. You know, I was, I think I was, let's say, three, 18. I was 22 years old at the time, a young man. One said, hey, you want to see some pictures? I said, sure. Here, I'll show you what we do. And he showed me these pictures. And friends, that just about did it for me. I saw those pictures. They had pictures of prisoners, and they showed them in South Vietnamese uh, holding these prisoners and doing terrible things to them. I mean, they were cutting off the scalps off of people while they were still living, and they gouged out eyes and showed me the eyeballs, and they cut fingers off of guys, and I, I couldn't believe it. And they were laughing about it, drinking, laughing. Hey, remember that guy we threw out of that aircraft, threw out of the, the helicopter? They said, yeah. Boy, I said, he, he just... Wiggled and wiggled his, his limbs all the way down, didn't he? And they just laughed about it. I said, you throw guys out of helicopters? Oh, yeah, we bring them up there and, you know, tell them you're going to talk. Tell us what you know. Of course, they don't know anything, they said. But they know one thing. They're probably going to go for a big ride without that helicopter. And we throw them out. If there's anybody in that helicopter with us, when we land again, they're ready to talk. Boy. I said, are there many guys like you? Oh, yeah, you know, we have about, you know, 50 in our company, but there's 30 here and 40 there and 80 there and 100 here. And I'll tell you something, folks, I wanted to leave that place. Now, they were good guys, and, but I just wanted to leave. I, I, I felt suddenly a suffocation. I felt the devil was in that place. I felt that I was surrounded by horror, and I was. Folks, this is the devil's business they were torturing prisoners, killing people. They showed me photographs of one girl that they had taken out, and they said the South Vietnamese had raped her, and then they killed her, they said. I said, what did she do? Nothing. 
We killed everybody in her village, and she was the only one left, so we took her with us. After we used her for a couple of days, we wasted her, they said. I felt suffocated. I felt I've got to get out of here. I felt I was with madmen. I was with, with reptilians. I wasn't with human beings. Oh, I learned real fast about the Vietnam War, what it really meant, what Americans were doing over there. There were many programs, of course, during the Vietnam War, but the main one was called the Phoenix Program. Now, that's where we got concentration camps. We didn't just go in and take prisoners and torture them and make them talk. No, we, we put them in, in camps. We, uh, we tortured them for a while. Now, eventually they killed most of them. They killed hundreds of thousands. But they made this an official camp system. This is what they do, friends. I'm telling you, this is what we did in Iraq. This was what we did in Abu Ghraib. And we have, we have established a network of some 20 or 50, I don't know how many, prison camps across the world. And other countries are cooperating with us. And we bring people. We put them in jets and fly them in there and torture them. Why? Torture does no good. We had a big report come out, an intelligence report. It said we got no useful information from years of torture. Anybody who studies torture knows that from the days of the, the Inquisition till today, torture has done no good. You cannot get useful information from people. Oh, I suppose if they had planted a bomb and it was about to go off in the next hour and you could torture them and make them admit where the bomb was, maybe you could go save some lives. But that doesn't happen very often, my friends. In fact, it never happens. So why are they torturing people? When we tortured people in Iraq, we had already captured the country. There was nothing they could do. There were, there were no weapons of mass destruction they could point at. There was no high technology there. We, we had all the high tech we needed. We were way superior to them. What did we want to torture people at a bar grave and dozens of other prison camps? What for? Why did we take women in and rape them? Why did we take young boys in and sodomize them? Why did we take young girls in and do terrible things to them? They didn't know anything. I guess, I guess you get down to the, to the realization we did it because we could do it. I want to talk to you about this Phoenix program. You see, wherever there is a war today, America is doing this. Wherever there is a war and they put American troops in, they're going to be doing this. This is, this is not a one-time phenomenon. And I discovered that night long ago in Karat, Thailand, in that apartment with those young men, that they were not evil exactly, but they were doing evil. And they believed it was just fine because these really weren't human beings. They were just chinks or you know some other name they really weren't human beings they didn't deserve the benefits of the pill of rights or anything like that in their minds now in vietnam the cia ran this operation but they had the cooperation of the u.s army special units they set up a string of torture and death camps throughout south vietnam the project was called the Phoenix Program. Now, now, why was it called the Phoenix Program? Because the Phoenix Program ha has a theory. This, by the way, it's even in the Bible, talks about the, the the great black bird that was decimated and was on the flames, and out of the flames came a serpent or a flying serpent. Out of death and destruction will come something new and wonderful. But all that came out of this death and destruction was more death and destruction. Now, sometimes. Entire villages and towns were targeted for extinction. You see, they worked all this out at CIA headquarters in Saigon. And they mapped off the country. There were districts. Every district had a, a concentration camp supervisor. And they had a concentration camps. It might be an abandoned hotel. It could just be a, a camp set out in, the, in the, the jungle. Or in a couple of cases, it was actually former zoos. Z-O-O. You know, there were reports of, of guys being kept in tiger cages. Of course, nobody was kept for very long because they murdered them. They got all useful information out of them and, and murdered them. Now, what kind of information were they trying to get from people? First of all, entire villages and towns were targeted for extinction. If they knew there was no good information in that town, but 
Maybe it was a town that had cooperated with the Viet Cong. Or maybe no one from that town had volunteered to serve in the South Vietnam military, our supposed allies. Or maybe somebody didn't like that town. Maybe it was a, a tribesman from the town next door, and he never liked that town. Maybe one time when he was arrested, he was arrested for drunkenness or something in that town. So he would just go tell the GIs, this is a communist town, bad town, bad town. They'd put it on their little marker for destruction. Then our guys would go in, and they would kill everybody in that town, in that village. You say, no, 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 that didn't happen. Well, the most prominent, the, what we all hear about is, is the people who died at My Lai. At My Lai. This didn't come out of the army. This came out of somebody who had witnessed the event and came back home and wrote their congressman. And no one believed them. The newspapers laughed at them. Everybody laughed at them. Finally, there was a, one congressman that heard it and said, you know, I'm going to look into this. Turned out they told the truth. Turned out, me lie. And me lie was prosecuted. They got a, a Lieutenant William Calley, he and his company. And William Calley went on trial, but then Nixon pardoned the guy. Well, he had to pardon the guy because there were hundreds of Lieutenant Calleys out there. Hundreds. In fact, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to two of them today. One is now the Secretary of State. He's a monster. He did it. He's a monster. He murdered people. John Kerry. John Kerry. Then there's former senator from Nebraska. Why, well, he dated the actress, Deborah Winger. He's famous, too. Bob Kerry. It's interesting. Both of them's name are Kerry. Bob Kerry is spelled with an E on the end. It's K-E-R-R-E-Y. John Kerry, and he doesn't have an E-Y. John Kerry, Kerry was a senator, U.S. senator from Massachusetts. He's also a liar, a filthy liar. He claimed uh, that he that he was uh, an Irishman. Why? When they had the Irish parade in Boston, he led the parade. He was a parade master one year. I'm Irish, he said. Catholic and Irish. What a liar. Turns out his whole family is Jewish. His real name is not Kerry, but Khan. K-A-H-N. He's born a Jew. His brother is a Jew and a full Jew. He goes to the synagogue. You see, John Kerry thought he'd be elected if he claimed to be a, uh, an Irish Catholic. That's true in Massachusetts. You can't be a Jew and run for office there. Bob Kerry, he's a liar, too. We'll get into more of that uh, a little bit later. I want to take, take you back to Mila. I want to show you what happened there. This killing, these murders of over 500 people, over 500 men, women, and children, old men, the burning of their entire village was carried out by these soldiers. It was approved by the generals and by the White House, by the CIA. So Kaylee, uh, Callie was indeed a scapegoat. Now, I don't accept the fact that he was a scapegoat and should be let go. I accept the fact that he was a scapegoat because so many got away with doing these things and he, he didn't get away with it. He was tried. But I, I want to explain to you what happens to a soldier like Callie when he said, I don't want to go do that. I don't want to go into an operation like that. There weren't many that refused or didn't want to go, but when they were, they were sort of blacklisted. They were put on a bad list. That was the end of their career. If you were a lieutenant or a captain or even a major and you didn't want to participate, they would blacklist you. He's not a, a acceptable officer. He's not a good officer. Okay, so they ruin your career. So here's your choices, my friends. Go out and mass slaughter 500 plus people or your career's gone. Which would you do? Think about it. Would you prefer just to go out and kill over 500 people or have your career ruined? One or the other. Cali chose to kill. Now, these people were rounded up, taken out of their homes. Many of them were killed in their homes. Then they were taken all out. They were in ditches and so forth, and they were told to stay there. And then the soldiers were all told, waste them, kill them. And there they were, trying to hide their little children, their little girls, their little boys, and screaming and hollering as they were mowed with machine gun fire until they were all dead. That was me lying. But the soldiers carried out their orders. 
They were given orders. And, and let, let me explain something to you. Now we know from testimony to Congress, now we know that there was a different Mila every month. And we were in, in, in Vietnam for how long? Wasn't years, over a decade. We lost 58,000 American lives. Wasted. Totally useless deaths. 58,000 American lives. How many Vietnam people do you think we killed? Some say 1 million. It's been estimated, uh, one guy has said we killed as many as 3 million. I read a book about it, a very, uh, an excellent book by a man named Doug Valentine. The, the name of the book was The Phoenix Program. He said in The Phoenix Program, everybody in all of these districts throughout Vietnam, and they had people in charge of every one of them. And they all reported up to the special forces and the CIA and so forth. And the CIA had a, an officer that supervised all this killing. What was the purpose of the killing? They said it was an anti-terror program. You've heard of the war on terror? That was it. They said to stop the terror of the Viet Cong, we're going to have to kill just like they do. Haven't you heard that before, friends? The only thing they know is torture and killing. So we're going to have to be good at torturing and killing. Have you ever heard that kind of talk before? I have. And interestingly enough, all of these districts of the Phoenix program were given quotas. You had to kill so many people a month or you weren't doing your job. Think about it. If you were a major or a colonel or and and and, and you had, you know, in, in your particular district, you're supposed to kill 1400 people this month. You sent a report out, we only killed 1200. You got a you got a memo bag. You're not doing your job. Kill more. More blood. Hmm. Another guy that wrote a book about this entitled Hostages of War was Don Luce, L-U-C-E. Doug Valentine, by the way, the name of his book is The Phoenix Program, but it's sort of out of print now. You have to get it at the library. And you can order it through in our loan process. Don Luce in Hostages of War wrote that in The Phoenix Program, that they, they, they use torture, repression, assassination, and most victims, he notes, were innocent. They were brought in only after a nosy neighbor, a village gossiper, or a family enemy falsely reported them to authorities as a potential threat to security. We know about threats to security. I mean, in the United States today, who are threats to security? Well, anybody who's a veteran. Yeah, anybody who served in the military, they're threats to the U.S. security, aren't they? How about domestic terrorists? You know, like, like you and me. Aren't we threats to security? So they got on a list somehow. It might have been their neighbor didn't like them. But you see, when you reported somebody as being a threat to security, why, they gave you money for it. Yeah, they gave you money for reporting people. That's why they had so many reports. You need another $25, then go report somebody. $25 is a big amount in Vietnam. Many people were accused of saying something they shouldn't have said. Maybe they didn't like the government. Maybe they didn't like the, the mayor. Maybe they didn't like the governor of their province. Maybe they didn't like the Americans being in their country. Maybe they didn't say anything they're falsely lied about. Many people died because they did not have, quote, sufficient support for the system. That might be like you and me. I don't have any support. I have insufficient support for the Obama administration. What if they put me on this Phoenix program list? They could. They could put you too, couldn't they? Are you happy about what your government's doing? They say that in this, this, the, 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 these primaries being held right now in America, that up to 75% of the Republicans are angry. They're angry. Why? They can all be if we had an, a, a Phoenix program here, and we probably have one in the computer right now, just waiting to be spilled out. They could all be enrolled in it. This is demented. Friends, this is demented. Th this is sick. Well, it came right from the company. It's what they call the CIA, Langley, Virginia. And computers were used to run it all. You know, they have a list now. They say there's over a million people 
on the no-fly list. How'd they get on that? Somebody put their name. Somebody told on them. Somebody said, I don't like an article that guy wrote. Somebody said they wrote a negative piece in the letters to the editor. Somebody said they're getting some magazine that seems to be anti-American. They're subscribers to it. You better put them on that list, that no-fly list. Oh, yeah. Who do you think is going to be the first one to get bullets to the head? People on that no-fly list. Everybody knew what was going on from the president to the secretary of defense in Washington, D.C., to the uh, four-star generals, to the U.S. ambassador, to the CIA guy in residence, to the bureaucrats of the State Department. They all knew about it. But to this day, decades later, they're all still lying about it. But you can find out all you want to know. In fact, you can go to Wikipedia, look up Phoenix program. I've got five pages here on it. It it tells a little bit about it, pretty much the truth. It says, quote, this is from Wikipedia. The Phoenix program was designed to identify and neutralize. That means murder. That means infiltrate, capture, terrorize, torture, assassination. The infrastructure of the whole country. They were going to pacify the people. It was America's pacification program. You know what a, 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 a pacifier is? A little baby, don't you? The little rubber thing they put in their mouth, and they bite on it. This pacifying. When he starts crying, let's put that pacifier in his mouth. This was pacifying. But they, 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 what they put was lead bullets in people's heads. It was a set of programs the CIA used. In all of these interrogations, they, they had interrogation centers set up in every town across South Vietnam. And they would bring in, they would kill or capture suspected people that were suspected, old men, women, even children were brought in. None came out. They all died in there. They were given numbers. And and the CIA proudly reported how many hundreds of thousands were murdered. They reported this to the White House. The information extracted from their brains through all this torture. I'm going to tell you about the torture when we come back in just a minute. The information extracted was then given to military commanders. They would use it to further capture. They would take one guy in and say, give us the names of 10 people who are anti-government. Give us 10 terrorists. Give us 10 Viet Cong. They didn't know 10. They were just a farmer. They were just a fisherman. They were just, they were, they were just villagers. You name 10 or else. And then they tortured them. They named 10. If they told them name a hundred, they'd name a hundred. Whatever it would take to stop the torture, stop the hurting. And then the U.S. commander, or the South Vietnamese military commander, would use those names. They would go out and arrest all those people. And see, it grew and it grew. It got bigger and bigger. Until the whole country was one huge concentration camp. And that's when we left finally what was it, 1972, 73? When we left there, we left behind a battered, bludgeoned, assassinated country full of dead bodies from our computer-run Phoenix assassination program. We were so proud. They're doing it today. They did it in Central and South America. They're doing it down there today. And they're doing it in the Middle East, we're doing it. Not just ISIS. We probably trained ISIS. We are the experts. We and the Israelis, of course, they're helping us in, in Iraq. They're helping us to torture people. And I'll give you more on that in just a moment. The United States, we're the experts on torture. Why, we wrote the book. I'll be right back after this brief message. I'm Tex Walker. Gulag USA. It's a video I did a few years ago, and it's still just as timely now as it was then. And in this video, I, I, I show you actual evidence that we have a 
concentration camp program here in the United States. And we paid hundreds of millions of dollars to corporations to set up this program. There are camps throughout the United States. And, and, and when the whistle goes off, we'll be taken away. Now, you've heard about the, those who, who, who the, are identified as red or blue. It's real, folks. There is a concentration camp program. And, and, and former congressmen have told us about it. In fact, on this video, you're going to see proof of, of it. And you're going to see Congressman, my Congressman from Texas, Jack Brooks, who wanted to know about it. He said, what is this continui continuity of government program, the COG program, and, and this filthy, dirty, rotten uh, Oliver North said, I can't tell you about that. And you're not supposed to ask me that question. Why? You're not supposed to ask me that question. He wasn't supposed to ask him that question. You agreed not to ask me any questions on that. And the chairman, Senator Inouye, said, Congressman Brooks, let's not ask that question. Let's, uh, let's, let's move on. Well, Congressman Brooks said, no, I want to know the answer. I want to know about this concentration camp program. I understand there are concentration camps being built in America. And Oliver North said, you, you're not supposed to be asking me that question. That's supposed to be super secret. Blah, 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 blah. Right there. You'll see it. You'll see him arguing. And anyway, said, Congressman Brooks, we've got to stop this questioning now. This is public hearings. We'll, we'll cover all this in private sessions, closed to the public. And, you know, that was right before Jack Brooks, he left, he left office. I guess he, he, he decided that he was just going to, you know, just talking about it. He was going to let people know about it. Oliver North, of course, was part of that program. Don't think these people are saints. They're evil. They're evil. Now, I have a video called Gulag USA. I want you to have a copy of that. You, you'll see what the potential is. Now, I'll admit we don't have uh, – I wasn't able to get into concentration camps that were operating, but you're going to see what we did in the past with the Japanese internment camps and the other camps. You're, you're going to see a barbed wire uh, – Offenses and encampments right now ready to go. And it's going to chill you. $25. Please add $5 shipping and handling, a total of $30. As for Gulag USA. Now we have another 60 minute CD or tape, either one, specify which one you want. A program I did about a year ago entitled. CIA terror, murder, torture, and rape in your name. And I discussed a recent, a recent CIA report about our secret military operations around the world torturing, assassinating, murdering, and raping people in your name and my name. Where these people are being picked up, kidnapped, flown to bases around the world where they're tortured, beaten, raped, and sometimes murdered. Now, the Senate ordered this report from intelligence agencies. And Vice President Dick Cheney and President George W. Bush said, you, we can't give you that. We, well, people will get furious, and it will help the terrorists. Why? It'll make them mad. You're, you're just helping terrorists. They didn't want it released. That's, that's what they didn't want. And I discussed that. Now, I'll tell you what really should happen. Dick Cheney and George W. Bush should go on trial. They should be put on trial. I believe there's evidence that they are guilty. If they are found guilty, then they should be convicted and sentenced to die. They should be, yes, they should have their life taken away from them. They are guilty of killing thousands of U.S. servicemen and then killing hundreds of thousands of live human beings, men, women, and children in the Middle East. All for the oil, all for the natural resources, all to help Israel. These are monsters. Look at George W. Bush. Look at Dick Cheney. They make my skin crawl. These are, these are worms. These people are reptiles. I want you to have this 60-minute audio tape or CD for just $10.
for either one, the audio tape or CD or the video, please add $5 shipping and handling. $25 for Gulag USA, the video, the DVD. Or if you want this CD or tape, specify which one you want for $10 and add $5 shipping and handling. Now phone us to get these two products or either one at Power of Prophecy. Our phone number here is 1-800-234-9673. Or you can write us to Power of Prophecy, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. You can also go online, powerofprophecy.com or texmars.com. Uh, and, and get today's program. Today's program, just call it Operation Phoenix or Project Phoenix, P-H-O-E-N-I-X. For $10, we'll give you today's tape or CD. Let's return now to our program. You know, I have discovered, my friends, that homosexuals enjoy torture. They do. Now, I know I'm going to get a lot of people mad. Oh, no, homosexuals, they're, they're good people. They're, I mean, I've seen them on TV. They're comics. They're, they're funny. They're, they're filthy, rotten, dangerous psychopaths. That's what they are. And they love to torture. They love to sodomize little boys. That's right. They're pedophiles. That's what the homosexuals are. They're pedophiles. <sighs> And it seems that that's what they do. When they, when these CIA agents, all these reports show it. When they, when they get these prisoners, they don't just, they sexually torment them. And it's, it's just, it's just terrible. Now, what kind of torture went on? This is from Wikipedia. It's online. Let me explain to you. A torture. Here, here is the kind of torture reportedly used at our interrogation centers. That's what they call them, interrogation centers. We don't, you know, Americans don't torture anybody. Oh, no. L listen to this. The <sighs> Military intelligence officer Milton Osborne witnessed the following use of torture. Now, listen to this. Here's a military intelligence officer. Now, this is what he witnessed. Quote, the insertion of a six-inch dowel, that's a like a tube, into the canal of one of my detainee's ears. And we've tapped it through the brain until he was dead. So they put a, a dowel, which is a big, you know, piece of metal or wood, in one of the ears, and then they hit it with a hammer all the way through to the other side until he was dead. Here's another one he, found, he witnessed. The starvation to death in a cage of a Vietnamese woman who was suspected of being part of a local political education group in one of the local villages. She was suspected of educating the people. So she, they starved her to death in a cage. How would you like to be put in a cage and starved to death? They did it. The use, this is this is writing now, the use of electronic gear, such as electrified telephones, attached to women's vaginas and men's testicles to shock them into admission. All my friends being supervised by the American forces. Let me give you some more now. Here's more methods of torture. This is out of, out of all these books. This is, this is, this was testimony by military intelligence personnel to our Congress. It didn't get to me. I didn't read it at the time. Did you read it? Do you know about it? Was it on television? Do they, do they, do they, do they, do they explain this to the kids in school? How about our universities? Do the students find out about this stuff? No. No, they don't. L listen to these. This is methods of torture used. Rape, gang rape, rape using 
eels, E-E-L-S, that's these water snakes. Snakes, hard objects, rape followed by murder, electric shock. They call it the bell telephone hour. They shock their genitals. Sometimes they would attach wires to the genitals. Other times to parts like the tongue and shock you. Then there was the water treatment, the airplane, in which the prisoner's arms were tied behind the back, the rope looped over a hook on the ceiling, suspending the prisoner in midair, after which he or she was beaten. They were beat with rubber hoses and whips. And if they were still alive, they used police dogs to maul them. Everybody on the blacklist got this treatment. That's why they never returned. I mean, they didn't want to waste food on them, did they? These people were just there to be tortured. How long can you last without food, my friends? What did it take to get on the blacklist? Did somebody just grab somebody and say, hey, when so-and-so, he's a, he's a Viet Cong, or, you know, this woman here, she, she's, a, she's one of them. And there's a lot of other things here. It says, between 1968 and 1972, Phoenix neutralized 81,740 people. Neutralized them. A significant number of others were killed between 69 and 71. And the program was very successful in destroying the infrastructure in many important areas. Hey, folks. You kill all the people in the village. Unbelievable. According to William Colby, the former head of the CIA, he says that the toughest period for the communists was 1960 to 1975, 15 years. But in 68 to 72, four years when the program was at work, they killed many at that time. Now, former CIA analyst Samuel Adams in an interview with CBS News said the program was basically an assassination program that included torture. Another Phoenix intelligence officer, Barton Osborne, in an interview broadcast in 1975, talked about a case in which a man was dragged out of the interrogator's hooch with a dowel protruding from his ear, put there by a hammer. All these activities, he said, were performed by American Marines. They would kill people by throwing them out of helicopters to threaten those they wanted to interrogate who were forced to watch other men being thrown out into the air. Abuses were common. Vietnamese would report their enemies as Viet Cong in order to get U.S. troops to kill them. Many incompetent bureaucrats who wanted sex with women would punish the women who refused by turning them in as spies, whereupon they were tortured and murdered. There were many fabrications of cases and false arrest, and many bribes of U.S. personnel. Boy. And there's a whole list of references here. There's 32 different references, 32 different references. Of course, there's... The personal papers of William Colby, the Pentagon Papers, the, all kinds of Vietnam War Crimes Working Group. Now, let's get to what Bob Kerry did. Remember Bob Kerry? He ran for president one time. He didn't get very far, but he got a little bit in primaries. He was a, a, a senator. He actually said one time, did you know, this is his statement, did you know that Bill Clinton is an unusually good liar? Boy, that made Bill Clinton mad. That's what he said about him. Did you know that Bill Clinton is an unusually good liar? Why? He would. Bill Clinton wasn't going to let Senator Bob Kerry, another Democrat, say something like that about him. So he put out the word. You know what Senator Bob Kerry was when he was in the Army? He was a hitman. He murdered Vietnamese. That was his job. In one notorious case in February 1969, Clinton reported that Senator Bob Kerry had murdered in cold blood more than a dozen women and children. Well, that shut Bob Kerry up. He, he quickly resigned from the Senate and was incommunicado. 
You may not remember that, folks. I do. He, he was he was said he said I'm going to run for president. It was right before the primaries. A lot of people said he has the best chance of anybody. Bob Kerry, senator. And suddenly this information came out about him, and he was nowhere to be found. He resigned from the Senate. Let me explain why. I'm sure that Bill Clinton told him, you know what we're going to do to you? We're going to put you on trial as a war criminal. See, they got all these guys. They did all these things. Bob Kerry, John Kerry. They're all a bunch of murderers. That's why they went in the service. They weren't really fighting men. They were monsters. And the press doesn't want to talk about it. But after all, if Bill and Hillary Clinton reports it, they got to, don't they? They're friends of Bill and Hillary. And if you don't do what Bill and Hillary wanted, why, you may end up like Vince Foster, dead in some park. Suicided, of course. War crimes are, that is a policy of the United States. It's not abnormal. It's not unusual. It's premeditated murder. And it's approved all the way up the line. They do it, so why can't we? That's what they say. When did it begin over there? And actually, it actually began all in, in, in December of 1963 when a man named Pierre de Silva arrived in Saigon as the CIA's station chief. The Viet Cong, he says, are monsters. They apply torture and murder. We must do the same. That's, that's, that's right. We're Americans. If they can torture and murder, why can't we? So he, he set up these counter-terror teams designed to bring danger, quote, this is his words, from the official literature that was classified but now is, is unclassified, designed to bring danger and death to the Viet Cong functionaries themselves. Well, that's it then. They did it. We'll do it. The only thing is we can do it better. we got computers to get all their names. We'll, we'll watch them all. We'll surveillance them. Use surveillance. We, we'll know every little thing about them. We'll keep dossiers on them in our computers. Friends, they got computers in America. What do they say about you? Have you, have you ever read certain items? Have you been, have you, have you donated to some politician who is anti-government? Have you gone to some protest meeting? I mean, have you ever written a letter to the editor? You could be on a list right now, friends. Believe me. They could treat you like they did Timothy McVeigh. Whether you did it or not. Now, Neil Shahan was a guy that was a writer. He wrote The Bright Shining Lie. Exposing Vietnam. But he says, you know, I never thought. All, he said, I was over there for eight years and I saw all these things. Hmm. Neil Shahan. He wrote the book, Bright Shining Lie. He said, I saw U.S. soldiers massacre up to 600 Vietnamese civilians in five different villages. I never thought it was a war crime. I just thought it was part of war. They go into a village, kill everybody there. Part of the war. It's not part of the war, friends. It's not part of the war. It's murder. It's murder. Now, Bob Carey, let's see, let me tell you a little bit more about that character. It says here, talks about the danger of this coming back again. Actually, it's still here. Jesse Ventura, of course, claims to be a, a, a Navy SEAL and Right-wing U.S. Representative Bob Barr, he actually introduced legislation to re-legalize assassinations. He wants to make them legal. David Hackworth was a writer for the New York Times and other uh, publications. He was a former military colonel. He defended Bob Kerry. He said, quote, there were thousands of such atrocities during the war. See, Bob Kerry, his whole job was Hitman. He would have a squadron of people. And they were told, go to this village and kill this leader. Or kill that woman. That's what they did. They went out to the village, found the people, killed them. Came back in. Probably drank their beers and had their mistresses and all that. Then the next week they went out again. Colonel David Hackworth said, there were 
thousands of such atrocities. He said that in 1969, his own unit committed at least a dozen such horrors. Really? Not everybody's evil, my friends. You know, during the My Lai Massacre, let me tell you what happened. 504 Vietnamese women and children and old men were killed. But one soldier was flying a helicopter overhead. His name was Yu Thompson. He was flying a helicopter gunship. He saw what was happening below. He couldn't believe his own eyes. You see, they have some people that, you know, doing this, or they're back in the base, they're camps, they're cooks, they're, they're whatever. Then they're the soldiers. Then they're the hit men. Then they're the monsters like John and Bob Carey, of course. But Meli, this, this guy flying this helicopter gunship saw what was happening. Risking his own life, he landed his helicopter. Right between the mass murders and their victims, he turned his own machine guns on the Americans. He said, stop the killing. And they did. They were like, what? He risked his life. He landed his helicopter. And he turned his own gunship uh, armaments on the... He said, stop the killing. And they did. They couldn't understand why, though, because they had been ordered to do so. It was just part of the games of war. Now, there's no doubt that Bob Carey, uh, Carey committed war crimes. He, he once bragged that he went to Vietnam with a knife clenched between his teeth. He did what I was trained to do, kidnap, assassinate, and mass murder civilians. Did he have legal authority? No. But he had the backing of the United States of America, he said. He now remembers that they did kill women and children. But the fog of war, he said, clouds his memory. The fog of war. Well, he had he he, had, he was on the gilded road to success. Though when he got out, they made sure of that. They said, "Okay, you you done all this torture and killing for us. Don't worry, we'll take care of you." He 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 he, he was elected governor of Nebraska. He dated Deborah Winger, the the actress. He was elect, elected elected U.S. Senate. He even became vice chair of the Senate Committee on Intelligence. And in 1990, he ran for president. Then he made the mistake. He self-righteously criticized Bill Clinton for lying when he was a liar who had murdered people. Well, you can't do that. Now, let's get to John Kerry. John Kahn, his real name is, you know, the Jew. What did, what did he really do in Vietnam? Well, he admitted to what others did. In fact, he pretended to be a real uh, anti-war activist. He came out of the war. He was only over there for four months, four months in Vietnam. But he did his share of killing, evidently. He, he raided places, and it was all part of Operation Phoenix, the Phoenix Assassination Program. He was put on a gunboat, swift boat. Now, he said about other soldiers, here's what he, John Kerry personally saw these things. Turned out he was a murderer himself. But he didn't tell people about that. But here's what he testified to Congress. In 1971, he went as a civilian. This is before he was elected to Congress. He went before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1971. He was, he, here's what he said. Quote, now this is Senator Kerry, also known as Senator Kahn, now our Secretary of State. I would like to say, he said, that several months ago in Detroit, we had an investigation at which over 150 honorably discharged veterans testified to war crimes committed in Southeast Asia. Kerry said they told stories that at times they had personally raped, cut off ears, cut off heads, taped wires and portable telephones to human genitals and turned up the power, cut off limbs, blown up bodies, randomly shot at innocent civilians, raised villages in a fashion reminiscent of Genghis Khan, shot cattle and dogs for fun, poisoned food stocks, and generally ravaged the countryside of South Vietnam. In addition to the normal ravage of war, 
and bombing. Goodness. I don't know how they had time for the war. They were doing so much, having so much fun killing. How many of those 150 that five, 150 that testified? How many were convicted? Zero. Was John Kerry convicted? No. Was Bob Kerry? No. Now what did John Kerry do? He was put on a boat. And he was told, we want, want you to take this swift boat, so-called. And uh, we want you to go up and down the, the Mekong Delta. That's the, the big you know, river, the river system there. And, and that's, he, said, he was told, take this gunboat. You'll be in charge of it as a lieutenant. You're going to find a lot of boats along that. You know, that's, where, that's where all the Vietnamese go fishing. There's thousands of fishing boats in there. They're, they're not combatants exactly. They're not anti-American. They're just doing their job. They're old men. They're young men. They're fishermen. But we want you to kill them. You're going to have a gunboat. They don't have them. They don't have guns. They don't have machine guns. They don't have 50 calibers. They're sitting ducks. That's why you're going to have so much fun killing them. Just go in there and take your boat every day. Go up and down the Mekong Delta. When you see somebody out there fishing, just kill them. Blow them up. If there's girls on board, kill them. Young men, old men, kill them. And report back to us how many you killed. That's what he did. That was it. That's, that's what he did after he got out of Yale University. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy. That's what he did. Now, he had been in the Skull and Bones, the Order of Skull and Bones, at Yale University. And his friend George W. Bush was there with him. He was two years behind him. <sighs> Think about that. He killed all they, they They said that he was very... Very anxious to do it. He 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 was one of the Operation Sea Lords, they call him. I'm a Sea Lord, L O R D. His swift boat would patrol the canals and the secondary streams of the Mekong Delta, it says here. Up and down in Vietnam and in the Cambodian border. His job was to terrorize the peasants. They thought if they terrorized all these peasants, those peasants would turn against the Viet Cong. Now, that's very smart. Think about that. If you kill all these people out there fishing, thousands of them, why, they'll turn against the Viet Cong. Huh? Are you kidding me? They'll hate you forever, friends. We're doing these things today. I believe we're doing them right now in Libya. We're in Syria. We're supporting Iraqi. We're supporting the Saudi Arabians, and they're doing terror against the, the Yemenis and Yemen. Wherever American troops are fighting a war, they're conducting these kinds of operations. Friends, it's wrong. I don't care what people say, it's wrong. If you're a Christian, you can't, you can't abide by this. You must oppose this. You must, with all of your being, Turn to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, would you have me do these terrible things? Would you have me support these horrors? I know the answer. I know his answer. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's what Jesus said, and he still says it today. This is Tex Morris. You've been listening to Power of Prophecy. Tune in each week and discover the power. In 64, hearing about the war in Vietnam and what the Vietnamese were doing there and how we wonderful, great Americans were going to go over there and help free that country and give them democracy and beat the Viet Cong. That's great. I actually volunteered for, for Vietnam. I volunteered. Well, the Air Force accepted me as a volunteer, but they sent me to the neighboring nation of Thailand. 
But I went to Vietnam a little while and got the Vietnam Service Medal. And then I went to uh, uh, neighboring uh, Cambodia uh, on aircraft. And But we were doing most of the bombing of uh, North Vietnam uh, uh, in Cambodia from Thailand. So really, I was in a way was there. Now, let me tell you how I first came to know the Phoenix program. Now, on the weekends, you know, we it, it was a place where you don't bring your wife. We couldn't bring our wife. It was sort of out in the country in, oh, I, I would call it sort of a scrub-type desert where I was stationed. We lived in huts. They were like, you know, like jungle huts, thatched roofs and all that. In fact, we had to go out of our our uh, little dormitory, thatched roof, and uh, to an outdoor toilet, and it was just like you know you had a country privy almost. We pulled a little rope, and enough water came down from the the container up there, and that's that's what we used to take a shower. Pretty rough. We had to watch uh, where we were walking because there were snakes. Didn't have any sidewalks, and had quite a few snakes, and didn't want to get bitten. But on Saturday nights, we would go down and, you know, and drink and all those things. And I wasn't really living for Jesus at the time. And But, you know, we would just have a, a good time, me and the guys. One night, myself and a friend went downtown, and we went and had a something to drink at a, a place. And about, uh, on the next table were about four or five guys, and they were there sort of cutting up and having a good time, too. They were Americans, and, you know... They looked at us, we looked at them, and they said, hey, we guys, come on over to our table. Come over here and you know, party with us. So we went over to their table, and they turned out to be pretty good guys, the kind of guys you want to drink with, want to have a beer or a Coke with. It turned out that they were not in the Air Force at all. Uh, we didn't even know who they were. They, they said, well, we're, we're in uh, Special Forces. <laughs> And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. And today we're going to look at something that is very, very tragic. In fact, this subject, it saddens me. You know, I used to read about things like this, and when I discovered the facts, I I got angry. I got really angry. But now, as I get older, I, I think I'm saddened. You know, I want to title this program today, The Phoenix Program. The Phoenix Program. Now, what what is the Phoenix Program? Well, it's torture. It's murder. It's done by the United States of America. Now, if you, you don't believe that America tortures and kills and does so on a massive, colossal scale, then you might just want to reach up and, you know, turn off the radios. I want to... Turn off your internet. Don't listen to this tape player, whatever the CD. Don't don't listen to it because you've been told. I mean, you've been told by Bill O'Reilly on O'Reilly Factor, Fox News. We don't torture. And George Bush and Dick Cheney and everybody says Americans don't torture. We don't stoop that low. They're liars. Somehow they've been able to convince Americans that they're that they're telling the truth. I want to talk to you today about the Phoenix program. You see, I have some small familiarity with the Phoenix program. It happened back in Vietnam, but it didn't end there and it didn't start there. But perhaps it, maybe we can see it in in its horrible nature by looking at the Phoenix program. Now, first of all, I want you to ask yourself, What is the Phoenix program? You see, in Vietnam, in the 60s and 70s, the United States really got its concentration camp program in high gear. Well, let me stop right there. What is that? The United States had a concentration camp program? 
and they put it in high gear? Well, that can't be. We went into Vietnam, and of course the the Viet Cong were the the monsters. They they tortured people, and they cut off heads, and did terrible things to civilians. And we went there to pacify the nation. Uh oh, pacify. What does that word mean? You know, for many years, I was a young man on in all this program and. 1962, I joined the Air Force, and the war was just cranking up big time. Of course, President Kennedy was killed a year later. I was in the blue Air Force, uh, Air Force uniform then. In 63, he was killed, and the war just exploded. We should have been getting out, but we really got in, and before long, we had over a half million troops in Vietnam. Most Americans couldn't even locate Vietnam on the map, just like many cannot, cannot even locate Iraq and Syria and Libya on the map today. But there we were. You know, 